Hi everyone, I'm Tom, and today will be the first episode of reacting to documentaries about Japan and analysing how good or bad some of them are. I recently finished my master's degree in interdisciplinary Japanese studies from the University of East Anglia in England. The course looked at the culture, history and art of Japan from a wide range of perspectives. Now a large topic of discussion in Japanese studies is how people in the West view Japan. It's very likely that documentaries, movies, news articles and all other forms of media that show Japan from an outside perspective will all portray Japan in a cliché view, such as limiting Japan's entire culture to anime, robots and overworking. That's why I'm going to try my best in this series to look at depictions of Japan and explain or debunk any information. I will preface this video by saying that I'm by no means an expert and I suggest that anyone watching should do their own research and if anyone knows any different they should call me out. But in general I will say that I do know a lot more than the average person and even the average Japan enthusiast. In one of the lectures on the course we were told to review a documentary episode and use this TV bingo card created by Dr Mark Pendleton as a way to focus on shows that just generally weren't researched very well. I have taken the liberty of adding some of my own squares which tend to focus more on some common cliches made in shows. Today we'll start with James May's Our Man in Japan. It is 5.45 in the morning. I am in a land that is equally fascinating and baffling. A country that is charming and hospitable, but where we from the West tread in fear and trepidation, believing that the slightest transgression of good etiquette is like slapping somebody's sainted mother in the face. It's a country I've been to many times before, but never really understood. In this case, Japan is just like any other country. We've been told through media that things like samurai honour are very much still prevalent in Japan and to tread on any form of Japanese etiquette would incite the wrath of any Japanese person who would instantly slice you in half with a glorious Japanese blade. But in reality, upholding the customs and traditions isn't much different than other places in the world. If someone said that beans on toast wasn't the greatest British dish to ever be created, then the lads from down the pub probably wouldn't be too happy either. All they ask is that you respect their customs, but especially if you're a foreigner in Japan, they'll probably let it pass. Now, Hokkaido has only actually been part of Japan for the last 150 years or so. It's about 20% of the landmass of the whole country, but only has 5% of its population. A lot of it looks like this. So Hokkaido was only incorporated into Japan around the time of the Meiji Restoration in 1868. The Meiji Restoration saw the return of practical imperial rule, meaning that the emperor had taken over from the shogun as the ruling body, though even at this time the emperor was only a symbolic figurehead with no proper authority. At this time, Japan went through a modernisation period and followed in the footsteps of the western powers in empire building. In order to build its own empire, the mainland of Japan annexed Hokkaido. The people living in Hokkaido were called the Ainu, who were essentially aboriginals, and there are still Ainu living in Hokkaido now. They were forced to assimilate into Japan and their land was taken from them and they weren't allowed to practice aspects of their culture anymore. The Ainu were said to look more similar to Europeans than Japanese as they have paler skin and more body hair, both of which would help with the colder environment of Hokkaido. It used to be considered great fun to laugh at slightly wonky Japanese translations in the instruction books, but actually the translation of Japanese into English often yields very, very fetching phrases that are actually much nicer than the words we really use. Here's another one. Um, this is a pencil I bought recently, it's Japanese and it's got all the usual sort of, you know, pencil rubbish written on it. But then if you look at that side, look, it says, made by elaborate process. So in many Asian countries, there can be a glorification of the English language. Some companies will use English on their products because it makes it seem like they are an international business, thus making it seem more popular and trustworthy. It could be argued that English is used in order to advertise to foreigners in Japan, and in some cases, it is. But a foreigner in Japan isn't going to buy a pencil just because it has English written on it. The real problem for me is the language, because if I travel to Germany or France, I can't really speak those languages properly, but I can look at the words and they make a noise in my head. And often their words are related to our words and you can work out a few basic things. But in Japanese, when you look at the signs, there is no noise in your head. It is an interesting concept, but I'm sure that anyone who's attempted to learn a language before has noticed the difficulty of attempting the language early on, especially non-European languages. Europeans can look at another European language and recognise the characters and then associate them to a meaning because they at least have similar roots. But if a European looked at a language like Mandarin, Korean or Japanese, there's no association. Similarly though, a Japanese could recognise some similarities in Mandarin because the Japanese language comes from Mandarin, though they wouldn't be able to recognise everything. 
Korihiro Watanabe has been honing his craft for 40 years and is edging ever closer to the perfect blade. And what an edge it is. And that's it for the first episode. The first one was quite short because there wasn't much I could talk about as I personally had no knowledge on the subject. Uh, I don't know anything about dog sledding, snowballing or fishing. So I've just left those bits out. However, to make up for the length, I will also look at episode two as well. Robots. Robots. The robot. Robots. Robot. The robots. Robot. Robots. Robot. Robot. The robotics. Robots. Robot. 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 Robots. They're brilliant. Robots are an interesting topic of discussion, especially when talking about Japan. Many people would think that Japan is the pioneer in robots engineering, and it is a key feature of Japanese modern society though it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Japan has implemented the use of robots since the 1960s, especially in heavy industry, which has contributed to the country's economic success. But in the 1990s and early 2000s, to combat the shrinking and ageing population and lack of readily available labour, the Japanese government and robotics companies have been developing robots capable of working in other fields of society. To that end, anthropomorphic robots, those with human-like features, often referred to as androids, have been created in order to cover this need. Yuji Sone, in his book Japanese Robot Culture, has said that the wide variety of media and cultural products that has arisen, including manga and anime, actual robotic machines, and government and corporate staging of robot events, have complexly shaped contemporary Japanese robot culture. It is likely, then, that all of these aspects have contributed to developing a society that looks rather favourably at robots, which, in turn, has managed to echo itself into the wider world. The most popular robot that people know about is most likely Astro Boy, written by Osamu Tezuka, thought to be the father of manga. Osamu's work, with specific reference to Astro Boy, shaped manga and anime indefinitely and has been a huge influence on many manga authors. Astro Boy is an anthropomorphic robot, or an android, which was incredibly popular in Japan, and it also became popular overseas later on, especially in the United States. It becomes quite apparent as to why both Japan and the rest of the world look favourably towards the idea of robots when series like Astro Boy were so prominent and influential. This plays into Iwabuchi Koichi's explanation of cultural odour, either a positive scent or a negative stink. I won't go into it too much today, but for a very long time, Japan had a negative stink because of its role in the Second World War, causing many Western countries to look unfavourably at Japan and any of its products and exports though shows like Astro Boy were some of the first steps to redeeming Japan in the global markets. The samurai were the warrior class of Japan, trained from boyhood in the art of war and fanatically loyal to their overlords until death, the samurai and their austere code of chivalry commanded fear and respect for centuries. So popular consensus would have you believe that samurai are very virtuous and noble and honourable, but in reality they were just like any other warrior. The battlefield isn't exactly a place for honour when your life is on the line. Like most samurai would fight using bow and arrows because it was a lot safer to send volleys from far back than to fight using a sword up close. Honour is great in safety, but not when you had a clan, money and power to keep you invested in living. And being the victor obviously lends itself to writing the history. Samurai were supporters of powerful landowners, and it roughly translates as those who serve. The samurai established clans, which saw the merging of many different families under one system with hereditary heirs, and branch families who served. Samurai have a long history of infighting and rebellions in the pursuit of power and control, and eventually the government and court system of Japan was upended and replaced by a shogunate, where the shogun or military commander headed the country. The decline of the Ashikaga shogunate, however, led to the splitting of Japan and powerful warlords setting up their own independent kingdoms. The country was later reunified and then led by the Tokugawa shogunate. Eventually, Japanese modernization and technology and conscription meant that official warriors were no longer needed, leading to the end of the samurai class during the Meiji Restoration after the emperor returned to power. These samurai would either go on to become bureaucrats or simply impoverished landowners. Not a very fitting end for such honourable people. So this is an interesting scene. You'll notice here that there is a lot of concrete along the beach. And generally this seems to be the status quo of Japanese shorelines. In this case it is probably justified as it seems to be close to some sort of power plant or heavy industry sector in the back there. However the Japanese government is notorious for disregarding nature and simply cementing things over. 
These concrete barricades are used to stop tsunamis from having large effects on the inland, which generally seem to work well. However, you'll notice that the walls actually aren't that high, and this caused problems in 2011 during the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. The tsunami was about 40 meters tall, I believe, obviously dwarfing the barriers. So when the tsunami hit, a lot of water actually got stuck on the inland, making rescue and cleanup operations really difficult. Of course, the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami was a once in a 1000 year occurrence, but the government still concretes over a lot of land quite unnecessarily. I actually wrote a paper on the impacts of this kind of stuff on Okinawa, and it essentially acts as a leash to force power prefectures to rely on Tokyo for money. But we'll probably get into that another time. The islands of Matsushima are not just aesthetically inspiring. They also buffered the bay from the worst of the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. The magnitude 9 earthquake was so massive it moved Honshu Island eastward by 8 feet. Over 15,000 people died in the tsunami. And in Fukushima, the tsunami caused three reactor core meltdowns at the nuclear power station. So, it is generally understood that the failure at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant is the fault of Tokyo Electric Company, who ran the, the nuclear plant, for failing to maintain proper security measures at the time. The systems were outdated, for example, and I hope I'm remembering this right, but when there was an issue, the protocol was to fax the Prime Minister or his office to ask them what to do or if they could enact the proper safety measures. This probably didn't have a large overall effect on the on the outcome of the earthquake and tsunami and the nuclear meltdown, but it shows how outdated their system was and probably didn't help the situation. However, there was also quite a large cover-up by the Japanese government because of lobbyists who lobby for nuclear plants and nuclear energy. Uh, many Japanese are still on the fence about the uses of nuclear energy, and there's no surprise as to why. Well, that is as much as I'm going to go into detail on these subjects without boring people in this episode, but I really hope that you learn something new about Japan. I obviously skipped quite a lot of content because of copyright and because I honestly don't know much about dog sledding or calligraphy or J-pop or whatever because we didn't really learn too much about those topics on the course. But first and foremost, this series is to just talk about things that I can talk about, to discuss Japan in more detail than what is usually given in, in these documentaries where they just dart around from one thing to another. I merged the first two episodes together just because there probably wasn't enough content for just one video, but I'm not sure if I'll keep doing that for future episodes. Uh, anyway, I've probably just waffled on for long enough, so I'll close out now. I am new to making videos, so I apologise if this isn't to a good standard, but if there is any advice, please let me know in the comments, otherwise just subscribe to see more videos like this in the future. Thanks for watching, bye!